point in the letter is talking about the Sabbath rest for the people of God. And of course, we know that Christ Jesus is our Sabbath rest. We rest in him. We trust in him. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, or in the light of these things, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And as we've been going through uh, the book of Job, we've seen something of God's sovereignty. We've seen something of God's care and love and grace and mercy. We've not yet seen God or heard from God personally. We will do in the, in the next few weeks. But the book of Job raises so many questions. And this morning, I'd like to just, as part of our time together, I'd like us to consider verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And this raises some important questions. Who, how, where... Why, what, when? Who, how, where? Why, what, when? But before we look at those questions that we see in this text, I just want to, to draw your attention to verse 12. Verse 12 speaks of the living, active word of God. It's living. So this word this morning, and each time that we we listen to preaching or every time we open God's word and read it for ourselves, it's a living word. And that means that, that it's not only capable of giving life, providing life, sustaining life, but it also means this, that it will speak into your circumstance today. And when you return to this word later on this evening, it'll speak into your circumstance for this evening and for tomorrow and for every day. One of the, the, the problems in our churches today, and we mustn't bury our heads in the sand, that the, let's just talk about the church in Wales, not the Anglican denomination, but God's church, Christ Church in Wales, to me, one of the biggest problems in our churches is that we have professing Christians who don't read the Word of God. And if this Word is alive and able to give life, feed your soul to sustain life, to speak living truth into your life today, then we would neglect this word at our peril. And whether we like it or not, the reality is when, when I go from church to church through these valleys, preaching, regardless of denomination, regardless of, of upbringing and cultural background, professing Christians this morning, as many of you are here, 
there's a problem that people don't read God's word. There's a problem that people dip in and dip out. There's a problem that actually we have, we have now a society where people don't read as they once did. Interesting, isn't it, that, that uh, in recent weeks I've had a number of people ring me up and say, I've got all these amazing books. They're Christian books. They're, they're books that teach of, of living the Christian life. They're, they're not just theology. They're very practical. I've got these amazing books. What do I do with them? I've read them. You have a library here. I wonder when was the last time you went in there and you, you took a book home after a service. You read it and brought it back and said, well, that, that has helped me. That has, that has nourished my soul. Listen, don't read Christian books at the expense of God's word, but sometimes it's helpful to read Christian books alongside God's word. Of course, we've had now the, the advent of Kindle for some years. But many of our libraries in, in our towns and, and villages are, are closed and closing. That uh, there seems to be a reluctance nowadays to read. And that's affected the church. Here we have a reminder that God's word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged or double-edged sword. It can penetrate to the depth of your being this morning. It can, it can just prick and it can just point to the spot in your life that needs attention. But it can also come and it can come and soothe and help and restore those wounds that are naked and open it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts and you know that's often why people have stopped reading god's word because it convicts them and it shows them that the way they are living is wrong shows them that their attitude is wrong shows them that that their 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 whole world view is wrong it shows them that that actually they are wrong when it comes to their thinking on how they live their lives. Let me tell you this morning, your life, your life, your life is precious and important. It's precious and important, not just to God, but it's precious and, and, and important uh, to, to the angelic hosts in heaven. Because we are today his witnesses we are his hands his feet on the ground if you like you are living you are a living advertisement of the gospel of jesus christ do you ever watch those adverts on tv and uh, and you watch it and you think to yourself that advert would never in a million years persuade me to go and buy that product have you ever thought ever thought that and then you might think that advert's pathetic who on earth would respond to that let me tell you people think that of us they look at my life they look at your life they look at our lives and say if if that really is the hope of christian living if that really is what an authentic Christian looks like, you can keep it. You can keep it. And yet, we know, we know, not just because we know the truth in our hearts, but we know from reading scripture that, that actually men and women and young people without Christ in their lives are missing out. They're missing out on peace. They're missing out on the joy of knowing our God and our Savior. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Here's the next question. Another problem in our churches today, that there's an absence of re Christians reading regularly God's word. Then people say, oh, that was a good sermon. Oh, I like that. Oh, that was great. And they walk out the doors of a chapel 
and that's the, that's the last time they consider what's being preached. And the problem in many of our churches today is that there's not only an absence of reading scripture, there's an absence of responding to God. And it's really hard. I remember years ago in Park, I, I was preaching. It was a very practical series. I was preaching on, it was entitled, Thanks, Thank God It's, it's Monday. <laughs> Based on a Mark, uh, it was based on a Mark Green book. Thank God it's Monday. It's about living a Christian witness in, in, in the workplace. And I remember we were talking about dealing with things that are outstanding at work. And as I was preaching, there was a chap there who was at that time working in the, in the steelworks in Port Albert. And by the we got time we got to the end of the preach and we got to the last hymn. He was up and out, gone. And I didn't think anything more of it. And then that night he came, he said, I apologize for, for storming out. He said, I didn't really storm out, but I was so challenged by what I heard, not from you, but from God and his word, that I drove all the way to Talbot, didn't wait till the next day, drove all the way to, to the steelworks, and sought out a friend who he knew was working and said, I've heard God speak to me this morning through his word and it's challenged my attitude towards you particularly. I wanted to say to you, please forgive me. And I want you to, as a, he was an unbeliever, I want you to hold me accountable that if the attitude that I'm asking you to forgive me of ever rears its ugly head again, please come and quietly say, John, it's, it's coming. And you can hold me accountable. And there was another occasion when we were talking about not stealing your employer's time. And someone left the church and went to their garden shed. And there was a, a wrench that they had borrowed, in, a, in inverted commas, many years ago from work. And had never returned it. So took it in to his line manager and said, listen, I took this from the workshop years ago. And I heard God speak and I've responded because actually what I've done is I've stolen this wrench from you. And I want to return this wrench and ask you to forgive me. True story. And his line manager said, you know, you've been working here for 20 years. And in 20 years, you've told me almost every week how God is real. And that Jesus is your savior. And your testimony and your preaching has had absolutely no effect on me at all. But let me tell you, friend, if you serve a God who causes you to do this, what you've done today, I want to know him. I want to know him. You see, it's not this word this morning, it's not just for us here, but if we respond to it, it can impact people out there and if we respond from our hearts then how God works then we leave that to his sovereignty it's his sovereign will that's what we've been learning in the book of Job isn't it but it starts with us reading surrendering submitting to his word and allowing his word to work in our hearts and then it creates and causes a response Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let me tell you, this verse encourages my heart today no end. Because it means that he sees everything that goes on in my home. And he sees everything that goes on in your home. He hears every conversation that takes place in my home. He hears every conversation that takes place in your home. 
He knows my thought life. He knows your thought life. He knows the attitude of my heart. He knows my intentions, whether they're good or bad. He knows my agenda, if I have an agenda. Everything in the whole of creation is laid bare before him. So not only do we come to a word that's living this morning and that can actually challenge our hearts, but we come to a God who sees our hearts and knows our hearts. And yet he's willing to hear when we cry in response to his word for forgiveness. Therefore, what's it there for? <laughs> My old pastor used to say, in the light of these things, since we have, and I know Pastor Mark's preached on this, since we've had a, we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So who's the high priest? Jesus, the Son of God. He's the great high priest. We don't need another priest today. Don't, know, don't need me in a gown or whatever with a hat and a thing around my neck because you've got Jesus. You don't need to go to confessional because you've got Jesus. Okay? And where's this high priest? He has gone through the heavens. He's ascended. We know heaven's up there because he ascended. And he's there in heaven, a man in the glory who is pleading, praying, planning. We saw that last Sunday evening for you. Because we don't have... He, the writer here brings uses the negative to bring out the positive. For we do not have, in other words, we have. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. That means we have a high priest who is able to sympathize and to empathize with our weaknesses. He understands temptation. Let me tell you this. He was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted like we are never tempted. What do I mean by that? Think about this. When we're tempted, what usually happens? We give in to temptation. Not always. But most times we give in. It doesn't take much for us to give in to temptation. Is that right? But Jesus, when he was tempted, he was tempted to the uttermost. He was tempted to the very point. Do we never ever get anywhere near there? And yet he was still without sin. So there's only one man who knows all about temptation. That's Jesus. Because he was tempted to the very very extremity of temptation and yet he still was able to say no so he understands temptation to be tempted is not a sin because jesus was tempted and our text or the, the verse preceding our text tells us that he was without sin but given into temptation that's that's what's sinful so let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There we are. That's the sermon this morning. Take me all week. A lot of effort gone into this. <laughs> Who? How? Where? Why? What? When? It says, let us come. First question, who can come? Who is being invited to come? You. We are being invited. The believer is being invited to come. I have a friend 
who is anti-royalist. Okay? So she's against royalty. Until one day her best friend had an invitation to a garden party in Buckingham Palace. And her best friend said, you can bring a friend. It was a plus one invitation. So she said to my friend, who's her best friend, who's anti-royalist, would you like to come? And she said, I'd love to. <laughs> I was furious when I found out. Do you know what I said to my friend? You're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. She said, you can't turn down an invitation for a garden party in Buckingham Palace? Well, sure you can if you, if you want to be consistent. You're anti-royalist. Ah, she said, but it was an invitation I couldn't resist. Another friend of mine who's not a Christian said he won't come to church because the church is full of hypocrites. To which I responded, there's room for one more. <laughs> because we're all hypocrites, aren't we? We can come on a Sunday morning and we can sing these beautiful worship songs led very helpfully for us by Brian and team. And then we can walk out that door and we can go home and something happens. And what do we do? We kick the cat or the husband or the wife. We can lose it in a moment. There's an invitation for us as God's children to come. It's an invitation that we can't resist. Even though we may have had a bad day, even though we may have a bad attitude, the invitation, if you're a professing Christian this morning, is to come. Who can come? The text says, let us come. Secondly, how, how do we come? My friend Bethan, she, <laughs> she went in her finery with a hat and she went and because she had and possessed the invitation, she went with confidence to the garden party. Let me tell you this, you may this morning feel like a failure, join the gang. You may feel that you failed in your responsibilities as a husband or a wife or a mother or a grandmother. You may even feel you failed in your responsibilities as a church member. And you come this morning with a heavy heart and you feel a failure. Join the gang. Line up with me. Because we are all failures, aren't we? Nothing in my hand I bring. Even our, the good things we do in God's sight are tainted with sin. Even our righteousness is as filthy rags. But we can come, and we don't have to come with, with fear and trembling, how are we exhorted to come? With confidence. You may say, well, I'm not really a confident person. Join the gang. You speak to Pastor Mark. Until five and a half years ago, he, he would never ever say anything in public. In actual fact, when he was a manager at PC World, if he had to address the staff, he'd get someone else to do it because he just didn't have the confidence to stand up and speak in front of people. Five and a half years on, he doesn't shut up. <laughs> but that's God, isn't it? But the confidence is not in self, but in our Savior. So we come because we, we come 
having been washed in the blood of Jesus, having been clothed in his righteousness, when Christ shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. Who can come? Let us come. How do we come? With confidence, because my confidence is in Christ, in his finished work on the cross. My confidence is in a risen Christ who rose again for my justification. Faultless to stand before his throne. Where do we come? Our text tells us, let us then come with confidence to the throne of grace. You've sung about grace this morning, amazing grace. God's riches at Christ's expense, grace. God's undeserved favor towards sinners, grace. We deserve nothing from him. But he blesses us. He pours into our hearts. He pours into our homes. He pours into our lives his blessing. And even though we go through painful times, even when we go through trials and temptations, his grace is able to keep us. His grace is able to sustain us. By his grace, we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Do you see that? When we sang that song, I was thinking of the story of the little boy who who wanted to go to Lord's because he loved cricket. And basically, he saved up what he thought was enough money to, to buy a ticket for uh, uh, to see England versus Australia at Cricket HQ in, in London, Lord's. And he went, and when he got there, the gate was closed, and he was told that he didn't have enough money to enter in. So he thought, well, he walked around the perimeter fence of Lords and he saw this high wall and he thought, if I climbed up to the top of that wall, I could just about see in and see a bit of the cricket. So at boys will be boys, he clambered up onto this top wall and he was there, still on tiptoe, trying to see the action. Then all of a sudden there was a, a man, he's a very tall man, big, bushy beard. And he went, son, what are you doing? And he quickly got down off the wall. He said, I'm sorry, sir. He said, I, I just wanted to have a glimpse of the cricket. You see, I've so longed to, to come to Lord's, and I saved hard and long, and I haven't got enough money to enter in. So I only wanted to see a bit of the cricket. That's all, sir. And this big, tall man with his big, bushy beard, he said, come on. And he took the young boy by the hand, and they walked in through the official's entrance into the corridors of cricket power. Out of the long room, out of the pavilion, and front row of the pavilion, he said, now sit there, sit down, and enjoy the cricket. And this boy was just flabbergasted, and he was there all day, watching the crickets and seeing the players come in and out, and oh, it was what dreams were made of. He thought, at the end of the day's play, no one's going to believe me. There was this man who took me in and sat me down. So he looked out to ask the man who he was. And sure enough, as everyone was filing out of the ground, he saw this big, tall man with his big, bushy beard. And he ran up to him, he tucked him, he said, Sir, when I get home, 
and people ask about my day. Who shall I say brought me in? Who shall I say sat me down? To which this big tall man with the big bushy beard said, tell them grace brought you in and grace sat you down. And grace, as we've sung this morning, will lead you home. There's an invitation here to come with confidence to where? The throne of grace. Why? Why should we come to the throne of grace? Why should we respond this morning by coming regularly to the throne of grace? I'll tell you why, because our text tells us that we might find mercy. Mercy. When I think of the cross, I think of these words, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. To find mercy. If grace is, is that thing that God gives us that we don't deserve, then mercy is God withholding from us what we do deserve. Mercy is God withholding from us what we do deserve. What do we deserve? Eternal punishment for our sins. What do we deserve? Eternal death. What do we deserve? Eternal separation for our sins because of our sins. What do we deserve? In short, we deserve hell. But for the believer, we've been saved from hell. We've been saved from eternal death. We've been saved from the judgment that should have fallen upon us for our sin. Why? Because Jesus, in my place, bore that judgment. He bore that judgment because he was bearing, he was carrying, he was wearing my sin, your sin. And it says in Scripture, he was bearing the sin of the world. So we can come with confidence to the throne of grace that we might find mercy. Mercy. O oh Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Have you ever prayed that? If you've never prayed it, you're not a Christian. You can't be a Christian unless you've prayed something like that. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Who can come? Let us come. How do we come with confidence? Where? To the throne of grace. Why? That we might receive mercy. What else? What else? And grace to help us. Do you need help? Do you need help? Do you need help? Yes. Sure we do. <laughs> Ask Viv, she'll tell you I need help. Of course we need help. Do you find it easy being a Christian? Yes. Praise God. You're a better woman than me, Nance. <laughs> Think about that. I find it incredibly difficult. It's not just hard being a Christian. It's hard being a Christian husband. And a Christian father. And a Christian grandfather. I'm a bumpy now. I find it hard being a Christian. I find it hard being a pastor. But I can find grace to help. I can go to the throne of God 
and obtain mercy and grace to help me. When? And if you've been listening carefully, you know that when we get to when, we're coming to the end. When? In our time of need. This isn't talking about a time of crisis. We have those. Phone call this week. At the moment, is a phone call every week. Member in the church, I've had an x-ray on my chest, they found shadows. The week before, there was a phone call. My grandson's got leukemia. The week before, my marriage is over. The week before, my, my grandson is on suicide watch. The week before, my daughter's been sectioned. The week before, it's something else, lost my job. The week before, I've lost my home, been repossessed. The week before, it, it's been like that. Week after week after week. And these are specific times of crisis. But this text isn't talking specifically about times of crisis. I was out on the streets last night with street pastors and they were short so I filled in. I was talking to a young girl there. Apparently I should know her. Can't remember her. Oh yeah, you told me about Jesus when I was eight. Oh lovely. How old are you now? 23. Oh, there we are. <laughs> I said, do you remember anything? Oh yes, yeah, she I remember this, that Jesus is always with us. Then the next question is, so what difference does that make to your life? Because if it doesn't make any difference to your life, then what's the point of knowing it? We might find grace and mercy to help us when? In our time of need. When's our time of need? Now. Now, today, tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. And the moment you think you can walk with him and walk as a Christian through this life without ignoring him, you are in trouble. You'll be like Peter who's walking on the water. Then he takes his eyes off the Savior and he becomes aware of the, of the waves and the wind and he starts to drown. The moment we take our eyes off him, the moment we think we can live without him, we are in trouble. It's a moment by moment reliance on him. Lord, I need you. Paul says, I can do nothing apart from the strength that comes from knowing Christ. I can do all the things that God calls me to do. I can be the person he wants me to be through Christ who gives me the strength. That's the difference, isn't it? Often that, that verse there is often misquoted. That means I can do anything. I had a guy last night telling me that, uh, that he, he knew a minister who at a wedding, it was pouring down with rain. And he stood there in front of the congregation because he wanted the, 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 the happy couple to have their photos taken in sunshine. And he stood there and he commanded the rain to stop. And then we wonder why our world's in such a mess. Because that is blasphemy. He's putting in, in himself in the shoes of Jesus. There's only one man who can command the rain to stop, and that's Jesus. That man needs Jesus. The girl who heard about Jesus, that he's always with him, with her, she needs Jesus. People in your family who are not converted need Jesus, but let me tell you, Christians need Jesus. And if there was a greater reliance and emphasis on him in your life 
let me tell you, there'd be a greater, there'd be a greater reaction from those nearest and dearest to you. Who? Let us. How? With confidence. Where? Throne of grace. Why? Mercy. When? What else? To help. When? In our time of need. Now. Now. What is your response? What is my response to this word this morning? You see, we can just quickly move on and, and have communion, can't we? And sing and go our separate ways, and we've lost the moment. How do you respond? How do we respond? How do I respond to this word this morning? Because this isn't something that's been conjured up in my study. This is a word that's come down from heaven. God has been speaking. Let us come with confidence to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help us in our time, in our day of need. Resting, trusting, hoping, living in Christ Jesus. What is your response? Heavenly Father, help us now in these moments to respond to you to respond to your word. Lord, have mercy upon us. Grant us grace and mercy to help us in our hour of need. We live in a church and a society and a culture and a nation and a land that needs you. Come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit on us, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit on us today. Please, we ask, for your namesake, for your honour, for your glory. Amen. Amen.